It is rare for a repeat murderer such as Jack the Ripper to embark suddenly on a killing spree. It follows, therefore, that the Whitechapel murderer may well have committed other crimes prior to the beginning of his reign of terror in August 1888, and there could be earlier attacks that occurred in the East End of London that might be described as the early work of Jack the Ripper. Trawling through the newspapers of the era, it becomes apparent just how common violent attacks and assaults were in the district where the atrocities occurred, and some of those that took place prior to the onset of the Whitechapel murders certainly bore similarities to several, if not the majority, of the later Ripper crimes. One case in which the injuries to the victim were comparable to those sustained by the later Whitechapel murders victims occurred in late February 1888. The victim was a 38-year-old widow by the name of Annie Millwood, who was residing at a common lodging house known as Spitalfields Chambers, which was located at number 8 White's Row, one street to the south of Dorset Street, where Mary Kelly would be murdered on the 9th of November later that year. On the 25th of February, Annie was admitted to the Whitechapel Workhouse Infirmary, suffering from stab wounds to her legs and the lower part of her abdomen. She said that the wounds had been inflicted by a man whom she did not know, who had stabbed her with a clasp knife which he had taken from his pocket. As far as can be ascertained, it was never revealed exactly where the attack had occurred, albeit it is possible that it took place at the Spitalfields Chambers Common Lodging House on White's Row, at which she was residing at the time. According to a later newspaper report, No one appears to have seen the attack and so far as at present ascertained, there is only the woman's statement to bear out the allegations of an attack, though that she had been stabbed cannot be denied. Annie was treated on the female ward of the infirmary, where she made a full recovery from her injuries. On being discharged on the 21st of March, she was sent to the Whitechapel Union Workhouse, South Grove, off Myland Road. Ten days later, on the 31st of March, at a little before midday, she was chatting with Richard Sage, who was employed as a messenger at the workhouse. According to his testimony at the inquest into her death, I was standing at the door conversing with the deceased, and my attention being called to another direction, I turned my back to her, and after a space of three minutes, I returned to find her lying down with her face on the step. I acquainted the porter, who had her carried into the corridor. Thomas Raidneck, the master of the workhouse, testified that she had never complained of feeling unwell and she always seemed in excellent spirits. On the morning of her death, he said that his attention had been drawn to her as she was then laying down in the corridor, apparently in a fit. I immediately telephoned to the infirmary for medical aid, he recalled, and finding the case to be one of great urgency, I procured the services of Dr. Wheeler of Mile End Road, who came at once and pronounced life to be extinct. Dr. Arthur arrived shortly afterwards from the infirmary and corroborated Dr. Wheeler, and I then placed her in a shell and sent the body to the mortuary. Following Dr. Arthur's evidence, with regards to a post-mortem he had performed on her, the jury returned a verdict of death from natural causes. Although it is apparent that the injuries she had sustained on the 25th of February were not the direct cause of Annie Millwood's death, the attack on her did share certain similarities with at least one, if not more, of the Whitechapel murders. She was, for example, residing in the enclave where all the victims would be lodging at the times of their deaths. Her attacker did target her lower abdomen, as would be the case with three of Jack the Ripper's victims, and the assault was certainly similar in nature to the repeated stabbing that would be inflicted on Martha Tabram on the 7th of August later that year. The problem we have today is that the information concerning the attack on Annie Millwood is extremely sparse, running to little more than a few columns in a handful of newspapers, and such facts as we have are based solely on her own account of what had occurred. However, Given the similarities, it has been suggested by several commentators that this may have been an early attack by Jack the Ripper, carried out before he progressed to the horrific mutilations that would become the hallmark of his later crimes. 
Like much of the district, White's Row has changed almost beyond recognition since 1888, and only one building, Number 5, which was built between 1733 and 1735, survives from that era. Spitalfield's chambers was located just a few doors to the east of this house. Nothing else has survived here from the day in 1888 when Annie Melwood may have been an early victim of the man who, around six months later, would bring terror and panic to this neighbourhood. Do you think that Annie Millwood was an early victim of Jack the Ripper? Let me know in the comments section below.